Good, welcome back everybody and thank you for respecting the time. Um, yeah, that's, it's good to have you together. By the way, there are seats now in the middle for you. Please feel free to move more to the central parts if you're comfortable. Uh, also, you feel closer to the panel and maybe the sound is better. So if you feel comfortable, please use the seats in the middle. I hope you enjoyed the coffee. I thought it was pretty good, although I remember I overheard somebody a couple of months ago who was not here was saying, well, our culture runs on coffee and gasoline, the first often tasting like the second. I hope that was not. You have to think about it, Walter, I see. But uh, I hope the coffee here was good, and I hope you enjoyed the uh, little break. Thank you for being here again. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank my colleagues from the Strategic Policy Support Unit for organizing today. Uh, so far, so good, my dear colleagues. Um, and thank you, Mickey, for taking pictures. You are, as usual, very good, thanks. Okay, this morning we've looked at some positive ways that tech is used to promote security and human rights, but we've already heard about some of the risks and challenges that were raised. Now, to dig a little bit deeper into the risks, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Georgia Holmer, of the Action Against Terrorism Unit in the Secretariat's Transnational Threats Department. A few words on Georgia, also her bio is in the package. Uh, she advises on and assists in developing and coordinating counter-terrorism and counter-violent extremism policy, strategy, and activities for the OSCE. In the OSC Transnational Threats Department, her work focuses on the intersection of human rights and counterterrorism and the promotion of preventative strategies and policies. And before she joined us in the OSC, she was the Director of Counter-Violent Extremism at the United States Institute of Peace. Dear Georgia, the floor is yours. There we go. Thank you very much, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. It's now officially afternoon, even though we're on se a session two. And um, our previous session was really devoted to focusing on the positive aspects of technology and how they've helped and enhance efforts to regulate crime, to keep people safe, to help improve humanitarian situations. And we, we heard some comments about uh, the empowering development of technology access to services, the chat bots that help catch um, trafficking offenders, and the wonderful photo display we had of all the technology that's being used in the SS SMM in, um, in monitoring the conflict there. This session, we will look a little bit more closely at the risks and the human rights challenges that are posed by these technologies, and that will be the focus of our discussion. Um, but we will also talk about ways to mitigate those risks and challenges and some of the governance structures and frameworks that might be helpful in, in assuring some accountability around those issues. We have uh, three wonderful speakers for this session and I'm going to introduce each one of them in turn uh, and turn the floor over to them for opening comments and then we'll have a, a little bit more of a discussion afterwards. <clears throat> First, let me introduce to you Ambassador Shramek, who is the permanent representative of the Czech Republic to the UN, the OSCE, and other international organizations. He is the chair of the OSCE Human Dimension Committee and also of the Forum for Security Cooperation. Ambassador, given your extensive work with the OSCE on both the human dimension and the security sides, uh, please outline for us what you have observed as key challenges posed by emerging and new technologies in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me in my double capacity of uh, the chairman of the Human Dimension Committee as well as chairman of uh, the Forum for Security uh, Cooperation, and uh, I would probably start by uh, saying that I very much liked the notion from the previous session that we are kind of 
pioneering in this uh, era of uh, rapidly developing uh, digital uh, technologies because while there are huge opportunities and which are uh, utilized uh, very well, there are also considerable challenges and, and uh, that's where uh, obviously are lagging a bit uh, behind those technological developments and, and this is the uh, area which, which we also used to discuss uh, in the Human Dimension Committee, that relation between, between uh, technology and, and human rights when, when uh, we are addressing uh, the important topics and commitments. Uh, of the of the OSCE, and uh, it's obvious that while new technologies, including the internet and social media, have become increasingly important means for all individuals to exercise their rights and fundamental freedoms, the same tools uh, can be misused by governments and private sector. And I'm not not talking about crime and organized crime because we talked about it in the previous session, um, to impose uh, various new restrictions and, uh, and other forms of interference with serious impact on the exercise of human rights and, and freedoms. And, and it remains a disturbing fact that even in a number of OSCE countries, human rights defenders and civil society actors are often targeted by state-sponsored harassment, threats, disinformation, surveillance, or online attacks. A number of governments have introduced laws, regulations, and policies that restrict civic, civic space, uh, which may lead to internet shutdowns, website blocking, or censorships. Moreover, laws uh, related to counterterrorism, anti-corruption, national security, cybercrime, and cybersecurity are often misused by, by governments to target and silence the civil society actors and human rights defenders, among others. And all these actions have detrimental impact on the enjoyment of human rights and freedoms. So it's there or essential that, that states not only refrain from using of the practices which unduly limit the exercise of human rights and fundamental freedoms, but also take positive action and protect and promote the civic space through and, uh, and also apply policies that uh, expand access to new technologies. It's of course obvious that the regulation of certain type of, of content, especially terrorist content and hate speech is nonetheless also important for the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms. And the regulation of digital technology needs therefore to find uh, the right balance and any restrictions imposed by states or private companies must be necessary, proportionate, Least, intru uh, least intrusive to, to achieve desired results. Uh, in the uh, Human Dimension Committee, which, uh, as I said, I have the honor to chair, uh, and, and which provides us quite a good platform for, for discussing uh, the ways how to address new challenges we have touched upon uh, the relations of human rights and technology on several occasions this year including in the sessions which were dedicated to participation in public and political life or very topical issue of addressing disinformation and propaganda and most recently in the joint meeting of the security and Human Rights Dimension Committee on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women, which took place uh, just last week here in Vienna. We have invited speakers uh, representing a wide variety of views and uh, backgrounds to share their experience, best practices, as well as recommendation in, in recommendations in their area of engagement. And together, we identify both benefits of new technologies, including the enhanced access to information, transparency, a broader involvement in consultative processes, 
as well as challenges, and, um, and these challenges were online violence, including violence against women, in this case, in political life, in politics, disinformation and propaganda, radicalization of certain groups, and security threats. And uh, this, there, there if, of course, are no uniform solutions for addressing these challenges. The regulatory measures imposed by governments uh, represent only a part of the solution. And overall, a holistic approach has been recommended by many participants, encom encompassing a strong emphasis on promoting and protecting human rights, creating independent and diverse Com communication environment and me media diversity, as well as media literacy and uh, awareness raising. Uh, uh, there was a general view that, that we do not need to uh, reinvent wheel when addressing those challenges, but, but what we need is to apply the existing uh, human rights framework right way, properly. And uh, so not developing anything new, but we have standards and these standards should be, should be applied into, into a new technology and, and their use. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for outlining some of the very significant risks that come with new technologies and for uh, opening up this question of whether there is a need to reinvent the wheel and whether the existing human rights framework as we have it is fully applicable to all of these new challenges and that's something we'll discuss more as our conversation progresses. But right now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Melody Patry, who is the Advocacy Director at Access Now. Uh, she leads the global advocacy, communication, and campaigns, uh, working closely with policy and tech uh, um, experts. She previously was the head of advocacy of free speech at the Index on Center Censorship in London. <clears throat> and uh, Melody, to start things off, uh, let me acknowledge that Access Now has been very helpful in advancing an understanding of the potential discriminatory bias that might be inherent in some of the machine learning that we're finding in new technologies. And um, some of us are familiar with the Toronto Declaration that your organization was instrumental in helping to advance. So uh, hoping that in your reflections here you can um, help address and help elucidate how technology might be addressing um, or might be affecting some of the rights to equality uh, that we have. Thank you. Um, sure, so just to start with the, the point that you mentioned in the Toronto Declaration, we felt that indeed there was no need to reinvent the wheel, but there was a need to, for some complementary measures or at least some complementary text that would unify civil society, the tech sector as well as states on some approaches with regards to the emergence of new technologies and not just machine learning, although that was the, 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 the focus of that, that declaration. And that was based on, um, well, that was based on many, many uh, constatations of uh, the potential abuse of human rights that were posed by some, some technologies. And I'm not like anti-tech. Uh, I actually, like my notes are on my phone. <laughs> Uh, my, my team uh, is working remote, so I need tech on a, on a daily basis, and I communicate overwhelmingly uh, through, through tech. But these communications also come with some risks. And when we discuss sensitive topics, we need to ensure that we are taking these risks into consideration so that we can take the appropriate measures to mitigate those risks. And it's the same with everything. It's the same when states are dealing with new technologies, when companies are developing new technologies, it's important to look at those risks so that we know usually, I mean, right now, we look at the risks after the damage has been done often. So when it came to machine learning and discrimination, uh, it was after noticing, for example, that when some 
uh, machine learning were being used to uh, accelerate recruitment processes or to aid recruitment processes in some companies, it was actually um, escalating the risk of discrimination and discriminatory practices in, in recruitment. Why? Because I think this was mentioned, well, no, I think it was definitely mentioned this morning, but the tech is being developed by humans and humans are flawed and the flaws that we have in our society are sometimes being handed over to technology. So when we are using databases that are flawed, these, uh, these flaws are, are gonna be not just replicated, but sometimes even amplified by, uh, by, by the technology. And we saw this, for example, when it came to also uh, some facial recognition software, which is why uh, increasingly, we see lots of initiatives <coughs> popping around the world asking for a moratorium or a ban for the use of facial recognition technology, at least by, um, by police force, for example, or by state agencies. And why people have had these concerns is because these technologies have proved to facilitate mass surveillance, but also to facilitate the targeting of people uh, from marginalized communities, for example. Uh, likewise, um, some of the new tech have also favored the, the spread of this information. We saw when, when your algorithm is based on promoting and pushing content that is generating lots of interaction, you're more likely to, to favor disinformation or sensationalistic content. Why? Because human nature tends to react a lot more to scandalous news than to, you know, a policy paper on uh, AI and, <laughs> and disinformation. The, these kind of news are not the news that are creating the buzz uh, on, the, on the platforms, but sensationalistic content, even when it's to say, this is shocking or I strongly disapprove of this, but as human nature, we tend to share more scandalous <coughs> news that sometimes are false or, or not true than, you know, more nuanced approach. So this is also one of the risks that if we don't think ahead, if we don't implement those frameworks that exist when it comes to, to human rights, we can, we can easily become um, a bit overwhelmed and unprepared uh, by the accumulation of risks. We've seen this as well um, when it came to not just new and emerging technologies, so not just artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and, and so on. We see this on an everyday basis. At Access Now, we have a digital security helpline that helps members of civil society, so journalists, activists, human rights defenders, human rights lawyers around the world. And we've seen that uh, at first we were dealing with a couple of hundred cases per year. Now we are dealing with a couple of hundred cases per month. That's because as technology also spread around the world, the risks also um, also spread, and some of the risks that we see are related with accounts being compromised. Just this week, we learned about um, Saudi agents. Uh, and being employed by Twitter and using their privileged access at Twitter to gather sensitive information, account information uh, about critics to the regime, critics to the Saudi regime. We see how this was not necessarily a, an, an issue of policy at, at Twitter, but we see how the privacy and the information that is being handled by Twitter and by other platforms is becoming critical and, and, and that's why we, as a member of civil society, as a, as a non-profit that I think has been very vocal when it came to um, not just human rights, rights but actually technology and where technology is leading us, we've been asking for well, the topic of the, the next session and of the, those days, which is a human rights-centered approach and we've been even talking about human rights by design, which is when technology is being developed for those risks to be taken into account. And I fully acknowledge that sometimes we can't predict uh, what those risks are 
are going to be, or we can predict uh, some of the some of the impacts of, of tech. But we can already predict uh, some potential human rights abuse when it comes to surveillance, when it comes to data protection. We do have strong human rights standards. We have human rights frameworks. But those frameworks are not always implemented. I mean, the US, where most of the large major tech companies are being based, doesn't have a data protection legislation. So we are seeing that um, this is true in, in, in a lot of other countries, including OSCE countries, where we know that we can do better in terms of implementing those frameworks and addressing those risks and protecting the rights of, of citizens worldwide. This strikes me as an important nuance to the conversation, uh, separating out those risks that are tied to the design and development of technologies from those that have to do with its application, uh, and, and especially when we're talking about risks that might be inadvertent and, and a feature of what, what the technology is. Um, and we're gonna turn now to our third speaker, uh, Mr. Jakob Chamanga, who is visiting us from Copenhagen. He's the founder and executive director of <coughs> Justitia, do I say that correctly? A think tank that focuses on human rights in Copenhagen is also a visiting fellow at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education in Washington. Um, Jakob, you have written and spoken extensively on the need for improved algorithmic governance, which I think is a very catchy <laughs> phrase. So I'd like you to prompt you to uh, make your reflections in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. So thank you to, to the organizers. Uh, I think um, it's a constant feature throughout human history that whenever new um, technology uh, is being developed, we have a, a tendency to panic uh, and, and, uh, and, and sort of uh, create doomsday scenarios. Um, so back in 1858, when the telegraph was the cutting edge technology, this is what the New York Times uh, wrote. Uh, there can be no rational doubt that the telegraph has caused serious injury. Superficial, sudden, unsifted, too fast for the truth must all telegraphic intelligence be. So um, clearly we, we have a different perspective uh, uh, today where, where, where we can communicate even faster. And, um, and I hope the dystopia that I'm about to describe now will look as outdated and ridiculous to human beings in 100 years as that New York Times piece uh, d uh, do today. So, so the, the risk that I would like to warn uh, about is of, of uh, rule by algorithm or algocracy, um, which would be this brave new world where um, vast fields of human life is, is governed by digital code, which is both invisible and unintelligible to, to humans, and which would place uh, significant political power beyond both individual resistance and uh, legal challenge. This uh, has consequences for human, human rights across the board, but I, I'll, I'll use two examples that focuses on, on privacy and, and free speech, free expression. So a month ago, uh, the Danish government, my government, uh, announced new plans to uh, drastically expand CCTV uh, surveillance uh, in, in, uh, around the country. My organization uh, warned that this uh, was is specifically dangerous in this day and age because there would be a temptation to upgrade uh, CCTV surveillance with facial recognition software. And lo and behold, two weeks after, uh, the chief of police went out in a big interview and said, we would really, really love to have facial recognition uh, because it would help us to combat terrorism and uh, organized crime. And to no one's surprise, lots of politicians rushed out and said, this is a great idea, we have to do this. Um, we have to give the police all the tools they, they need. If uh, the Danish police get their wish granted, uh, it would not be the first government in, in Europe to, to implement and use uh, facial recognition. Uh, it is being used in, in the UK, uh, where it has even been accepted by, by a court in the UK, though I think it's been appealed. Uh, we see it in, in France, and we see it maybe most worryingly in Serbia, where uh, the software has, is being supplied by Huawei, a Chinese uh, company, which, which raises serious questions about possible profiling of, of dissenters. Um, and I think the problem with, with AI-powered facial recognition is that it is surveillance on, on steroids, really. It, it, it potentially allows for mass surveillance of every single individual when moving about in, in, in public. And when matched against databases that could include everything 
you know, from crime record, travel records, social media accounts, uh, and so on, um, every citizen would potentially be completely transparent to the government while making the government opaque and impenetrable to, to the citizen. Uh, this has huge potential for social control. Would you, would you be willing to participate uh, in, a, in, a, in an anti-government demonstration, for instance, if the police stood by with, with, uh, with cameras that were using uh, facial recognition uh, software and you had no idea where the, the biometric data would be and what it would be matched with? So, so I think this is, a, is, is, is one of those uh, really burning questions, and I think sort of the, 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 the catch-all um, use of facial recognition in, in the general public sphere is, is, a, is, a, is a bright line that we should avoid, as opposed to you know, targeted use in an airport or, or, or something like that. Um, the other uh, issue is that of free expression. Um, so earlier this week, uh, Freedom House released their annual uh, Freedom on the Net report. It showed the, uh, the, the depressing but predictable development that, that internet freedom is in the decline for the ninth consecutive year. And, and of course, th there's nothing surprising about the fact that authoritarian states uh, use online censorship to control the flow of ideas and information. Uh, that, that really is a feature and not a bug of of a liberal statecraft and has been so forever. Uh, but in a new report, my organization, I, I, this report I did with, with a Swiss human rights activist called uh, Joël Fiss, we show that European democracies have also contributed to this decline. Uh, and the most, uh, the most uh, prominent weapon in the online arsenal of, of democracies is the German law called the Network Enforcement Law, which was uh, entered into force in 2018 and which requires social media platforms of a certain size to remove illegal content uh, within 24 hours or a week, depending on how manifestly unlawful, or face fines of up to 50 uh, million euros, so uh, imposing what we call intermediary liability. Of course, there are genuine reasons why even democracies could feel threatened by, by uh, online extremism, disinformation, uh, terrorist content, uh, and, and, and many other forms of, of uh, undesirable content. But I think there are real costs when liberal democracies use illiberal tools to fight for democratic uh, values. So what our report shows that is that in two years, 13 countries have uh, more or less copy-pasted the, uh, the, 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 the NETS GG, the Network Enforcement Act matrix. Some of these countries include Belarus, Russia, Vietnam, Venezuela, Honduras, Philippines, and Malaysia, uh, countries where uh, the, the German uh, law has been used to justify much more repressive measures uh, because they don't have the same safeguards and free speech protections that, that, that Germany uh, has. Um, and what is interesting is that the majority of these states actually explicitly refer to the German law to justify uh, their, own, uh, uh, their own laws. Um, and what this means is, uh, among many other things, is that tech platforms are being incentivized or even obliged to use automated content moderation um, uh, and upload filters to remove illegal content um, for instance, Mark Zuckerberg said that the single most important improvement in enforcing our policies is using artificial intelligence. And what would that do? It would remove content faster before anyone even sees it rather than waiting until it has been reported. So wh what we're seeing with automated content and upload filters uh, is that it will allow governments and corporations to move us back uh, into the bad old days of preventive pre-publication censorship that was sort of... Uh, <laughs> That, 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 that was uh, one of the, the, the biggest fights of the Enlightenment, for instance, you know, the idea that you had a right to, to publish uh, your, your ideas. Um, so so, um, so, so that, that's one danger of that. And I would say, in general, um, there are strong temptations for liberal democracies in all states to govern with algorithmic tools that promise huge reward, rewards in, in efficiency, consistency, and precision. Um, but I also think there are good reasons, even though we have human rights standards, um, some of these procedures and standards uh, will not necessarily be able to serve as a check uh, on the growth of, of algorithmic uh, um, governance because um, they will become increasingly incomprehensible to, to, to human beings. So even an engineer that has, this, that has designed a sophisticated machine learning software will not necessarily be able to understand why 
uh, the, uh, the, 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 the algorithm has, has flagged someone at a border or flagged specific content or, or, or flagged someone uh, based on facial recognition. Um, so what does that mean? That means you don't necessarily get a recent decision of why you were subject to some kind of automated decision. And even if it's a human being that, that makes the ultimate decision, if that human being does not understand why, uh, why the, the, the technology says that you should make this decision, how, how are you going to appeal that to a court? How are you going to use um, uh, like issues like proportionality or um, uh, transparency uh, and so on that, that, are, that are built in features of, of rule of law, human rights uh, protection? So, so that, in, I think, is a huge ta challenge. Um, so huge benefits in terms of technology, but, but huge challenges, and we may not even have the right, um, or, or at least not the fully updated framework to counter uh, algocracy. Thank you. Jakob, yeah, thank you very much uh, for all of these ideas. It seems that we're all talking about some of the same rights in our observations. We're talking about privacy and freedom of expression. We're talking about anti-discrimination. We're talking about the closing of civic space. But there doesn't seem to be a full consensus among the panelists here as to whether the existing human rights framework, as we know it, is fully sufficient and applicable to addressing these risks. Um, Ambassador, you mentioned that your assessment that you felt there wasn't a need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, Melody, I heard you said that, say that there was need for complementary texts of some sort. And Jakob, you just explained to us your perspective that you felt the complexity of the technology was such that made application of the existing legal framework difficult. Uh, <clears throat> so let's continue that conversation a little bit more. Is there a need, especially as we consider the role of the private sector in developing these technologies, uh, is there a need to explore new mechanisms uh, for oversight or for accountability in addressing these risks? And what would a complementary text or uh, framework be to the existing human rights uh, legal framework that we have. Um, <clears throat> who would like to take a first stab at that question? Any volunteers? Yeah, this is, the, this is of course, the, 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 the difficult question. I, I don't want to suggest that human rights standards are not useful uh, at all. Uh, so if you take the European Court of Human Rights has many important decisions on, on mass surveillance uh, uh, with, with good principles that might be applicable in, in some cases. But, but the more you, you move towards uh, algorithmic governance, the more difficult sort of, for instance, you have to have a recent decision. Well, how, how do you know that? And also even there's a buzzword in, in these discussions about transparency. I agree with that, but you know, um, to, which, to which degree? Because even if, the, if, the, if even the engineer does not, is not able to, uh, to explain to you why a technology made a specific decision, or even if it did, you know, if you opened up the algorithm that's, that flagged me as someone who was in, undesirable to enter a specific country, well, you know, would I understand the, the, the algorithm? There's no way I would, I, I would be able to, to understand uh, uh, the algorithm. So, so I think... Whether, 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 whether courts um, will be able to interpret existing standards in a, in a, certain, in a such a way as to provide a, a sufficiently robust protection, I think, is an open question because many of these questions have not yet been, been really litigated. I, I think there was this decision in the UK about facial recognition technology where, where a local court said that this was okay. Um, but it might be that if, if it went to Strasbourg, for instance, the European Court of Human Rights would, would, uh, would, would come to a different uh, uh, conclusion. Um, so so I, don't, I don't have like the silver bullet of, 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 of explaining. I think uh, uh, certainly we can adapt standards. I mean, human rights standards uh, are in themselves built on, on previous standards that, that go back like the French Declaration of, Human, of, of, of the Rights of Man uh, and, and so on. Uh, so, so it's certainly possible to upgrade, but will it be enough? I'm, I'm, I'm not certain. Beyond the application of, um, beyond the need for new texts, I would actually be more careful about the fact that 
some countries, actually a lot of countries, are already moving forward to address some of the risks that they see, whether it's the fight against terrorism or how to address uh, disinformation and misinformation, um, how do we deal with you know, um, terrorist content being streamlined uh, in, in live and, and do we need new laws against that and so on. So we're seeing that across the world actually we have um, all of those laws and initiatives blossoming, bl blooming from, from, from all parts trying to address those, those new issues that are not really new issues because you know when we talk about discrimination, terrorism, all of these um, predated the internet and there is sometimes a tendency to blame the internet for a lot of societal issues um, and, and, and because it seems that it's easier to use the internet as a scapegoat as opposed to looking at some long-term uh, governmental and sometimes beyond governmental like systemic systems that have uh, sometimes allowed or that have not addressed those issues in, in the correct manners. So I would say when we are seeing these initiatives, it's important to immediately look at the human rights framework and ensure that there is, and I'm not saying that all of those initiatives are necessary, sometimes um, there are already existing laws to address those, um, those issues when it comes to terrorism, for example, and, and the fight against extremism. But whenever these initiatives are, are, are seeing the light of day, it is important that from the start, first of all, there are consultations with different actors, not just states between states or states and, and, and tech companies, but civil society are often at the forefront of some of the risk and some of the impacts of, of those laws and those initiatives. So it's important that they're part of, of the, the discussion as well. And at the risk of appearing as being like the nagging civil society actor, always asking for respect for freedom of expression, always asking for respect for privacy. It's because we know, we, we, we have evidence um, of the harm or the potential harm to communities that, um, that new legislation and new initiatives that fall short on human rights standards uh, can have on, on, on people. Even when we think, for example, uh, on the issue of internet shutdown that was mentioned just before, internet shutdowns are being appeared as the solution when the situation is escalating, when we don't know how to control uh, the spreading of information, the spreading of news that can be upsetting to the authorities, we're just pulling the plug. Initially, we immediately thought, oh, this is a violation of freedom of expression, which it is, of course. But what we noticed was that the impact on the economy, the impact on the right to life when people were not able to uh, contact emergency services, when it was completely affecting the supply chain of medicines in, in, in different parts of the world. Like we are seeing that actually the harm to communities and the impact on, on people's lives go way beyond what has been expected by um, a government that ordered a, an internet shutdown. So whether it's when we see those new charters, new treaty, new call, some of them, uh, you know, Access Now is, is part of, so I'm not just uh, critical of all of those new initiatives trying to address uh, the issues that our, our society is challenged with. But for me, it's, it's, it's an issue of ensuring that at the core of each initiative, human rights are, are, are present and the human rights approach is being implemented, not just a not just a, a, a cute sentence or, or, or um, a mention in a text, but that it's actually being thought through and whether that's what Jakob proposes with, yeah, some, some new regulations or, or, or some additional mechanisms to ensure that human rights are, are being respected and, and implemented. That, that's the whole question. Thank you. Well, I think this brings us back to our, the description of a holistic response that's needed that involves both private and public partnerships and ongoing consultations regarding this. Uh, I, I think what we'll do now is open the floor up for questions uh, on this provocative question of, of how to mitigate some of these risks and uh, or questions about, additional questions about the risks posed by new technologies. Are there any questions from the floor? 
Yes, please. Hi there. Yes, thank you so much. Not that tall. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Christine Harper. I'm with the U.S. delegation to the OSC, uh, but I'd like to make it clear that this question I'm about to ask is uh, in my personal capacity, uh, just out of curiosity. Um, I've been tracking in the news, at least in the United States, um, the recent rise of, I think, what's called genetic forensic investigations. And this has to do with police and law enforcement having access to genetic databases, and then they're able to, usually by finding uh, a, a DNA match with a close male relative, or sorry, non-gendered, any relative, they're able to narrow down some cold cases, specifically homicides and rapes in the United States. Um, there was a very famous case, the Golden Gate rapist from the 70s and 80s and 90s in California, and they were able to close this case. And I was just wondering, um, do you, any of you see this as a risk? I have some concerns um, that I haven't seen addressed about whether this, in fact, might be a violation of, of, of individual human rights to use this information that someone did not even give up on their own, um, but is being uh, given by family members to investigate these types of cases. And I know we were talking about uh, algorithms, um, but genetic availability of genetic information, of course, is, is, is new technology. So I would appreciate your thoughts on that. Thank you. No, everything related to the new DNA testing is really interesting. We had that discussion internally. Uh, I remember because when, and the, the question I think that you, you did not mention, but the question of consent uh, is quite interesting. And we're seeing that indeed when an individual doesn't give content, consent, what does it mean? Um, in this case, it's the, the use of DNA testing that was provided by the family was used in a, in a criminal case. But there are lots of other cases. I mean, there, there's been lots of publications lately about the risks posed by the collection by private companies of DNA samples, usually because people are curious. Uh, when we think about a country like the United States, there is the similar phenomenon in the Caribbean when a lot of people from the African diaspora or you know, African-American black people in the Caribbean, for example, are curious about their origins, and it's something that you can even have as a birthday present. Uh, people are offering gifts for, for DNA testing, and then we have no idea what's, gonna, what's going to be the use of, of uh, that data. And it's, it's not just data that can be changed. It's not like a credit card number or a phone number that you can change if it's been compromised. It's data that doesn't change. You can't change your DNA. Uh, and if that is being compromised and misused against you, um, we can see immediately how, what kind of abuses could, 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 could happen. Uh, so whether it's because it's being shared by um, state agencies or, or, or police forces outside of any kind of jurisdiction, outside of any kind of uh, regulation on, on that particular use, or whether that that's being used by a malicious actor who just managed to, to hack the database of a, of a private testing company and who just decided to, to use that data to I don't know, impersonate people or to, um, to fabricate evidence in, in other cases. I mean, we can, we can start entering the, this door of almost like a dystopian but not so dystopian uh, future when it comes to what is at stake. So I, I don't really have the, the answer. I, I, have, I share similar concerns on a, on a personal basis, and I know that um, at Access Now we don't have a, a position on that particular point, but we're definitely monitoring closely. And, and usually when, when people are asking for our advice, we, we tend to be on the more careful side um, of the question. Other questions? Please. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Barbary from the Canadian delegation. A very interesting discussion. Um, Jakob, 
when you talked about the risks of algorithms, one thing that came to mind is um, the unintended consequences, as you were referring to. Uh, and I was thinking to, in criminal cases, the, the aspect of um, if there is inadmissible evidence because, you know, the, the idea of the, forbidden, uh, the poison tree or the poison chalice, uh, and how um, on a case-by-case -case basis sometimes from an instinctive uh, perspective that seems wrong. If you, you, know, you have the evidence that someone committed the crime but it's thrown out because the, it, it was inadmissible. Um, on a personal basis you can say that's wrong. But when you step back and look at it from a societal point of view, you say, well, the reason we do this is because if we didn't, then authorities could uh, abuse uh, the process and innocent people could be harmed. But as you, I think, rightly pointed out, with algorithms, we might not even understand where the misuses come from. So as we move forward here, uh, and I think y it was an interesting point about the telegraph, but I, I think you could make the argument that with the telegraph, the amount of information, as, as our colleague here said, there's so much information now that human beings cannot, um, cannot take it all in, whereas even then, the New York Times could take that information in. Um, so would our governments, in partnership and collaboration, are we able to even assess what the risks are and whether we should uh, potentially um, stop, if you, even that's possible, the development of algorithms that could have great benefits because of potential risks? How, how do you see that moving forward? Because we don't know what the consequences might be, but I think you do um, put forward a fairly chilling potential future. Um, but are we able to say no to that now, given all the benefits that it could have? So I don't think we know the answer, but I'd be interested in your views. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's an easy one. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I generally don't believe in sort of halting the advancement of, of, of technology and science, but I do think, you know, there was a, there was a time when the, when the Silicon Valley motto was sort of to, to move fast and break things. I may, maybe, uh, you know, that, that, that should not uh, be, be the motto. Uh, and I think it would be a very good thing to, to, for, 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 to have, for instance, a human rights due diligence uh, and an and impact assessment. We might not, you know, there'll be unknown unknowns. Uh, and I think those, uh, you know, they, those are unavoidable, but we can at least sort of try to be smarter than we, than we have perhaps been uh, so far in, in, in actually forcing uh, corporate actors and governments to think about the unintended consequences or even the intended consequences if, if more nefarious actors uh, use uh, the, the, the technology. So I think that's probably, that's probably been, been lacking. Uh, also because the, the technological development is just so, so huge um, and that, 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 you know, it's probably the last thing on, on the mind of someone who is a developer in, uh, in, in Silicon Valley uh, and, and who just has to try uh, and, 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 and maximize profits and, and get inv investors on board. But, but I think, you know, had Facebook done that earlier, maybe they would have saved a lot of lawyers' fees and, and headaches and humiliating uh, uh, appearances in Congress. Any other questions? Please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Veronica Ionescu with the Permanent Mission of Romania here in uh, Vienna. Uh, thank you very much for uh, these uh, thought, uh, thought-provoking uh, remarks. I will pick up on the idea of disinformation and um, um, also refer to a side event we, together with um, we, uh, my country, together with Finland and the two autonomous institutions, RFOM and uh, ODIR, held in, uh, in Warsaw this, uh, this year in the margins of the HDIM, dedicated to, to, this, uh, to this new, new phenomenon and the ways of building resilience of citizens. So how, how tackle this information that uh, affects uh, access to information and uh, how, uh, how um, uh, the capacity of our citizens can, uh, can be um, strengthened. And um, when it comes to this information, of course, we uh, naturally talk about new technologies and multiple social media platforms. And I would be very much interested in hearing your uh, ideas on uh, ways to fight properly against these uh, new um, and uh, mostly invisible threats 
the negative impact when it comes to credibility, trust, and reliability of citizens, of their authorities. And uh, if you see uh, more um, um, solutions in, uh, in this field. Thank you very much. Is that for all speakers? Uh, I can try to uh, very briefly because what we think is uh, the answer uh, lies in media uh, diversity as well as media uh, literacy and, and uh, awareness raising simply bringing, uh, bringing it to the attention uh, of the public that, uh, that there are risks there is a lot of intended uh, disinformation and simply to be able to read uh, in between lines and, and to compare to compare uh, news and uh, and not to, to take everything what they hear uh, in news or online as a verified fact. Thank you. So the need to build critical thinking skills in audiences to consume media with more responsibility. Anyone else would like to comment on that question? Uh, strong agreement with uh, media literacy and the need for critical thinking. I am part of the people who receive lots of uh, false information that seem completely innocuous on WhatsApp or on Facebook. So I would have a family member sharing a photo of a flower saying, saying this Himalayan flower flourishes every uh, 400 years. We are a lucky generation because this year it decided to, to blossom and so on, which was completely false. Um, but it was seen as a, you know, a, a lovely news to share with the people who you, who you love. And immediately, as soon as I uh, received it, my first instinct was to Google Himalayan flower flourishing 400, every 400 years and so on. And immediately I was told, no, this is the hoax. It actually started in China. It was telling you actually like the, the story of the hoax, which was fascinating. And then it, it made me think like this is a really innocuous news, like why would people create hoaxes like that to be spread among, because it spread, it started as a Chinese hoax, then it moved to, you know, like uh, the Asian continent was translated, so it was translated in lots of different languages uh, in, 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 in India, and to reach, I received it in French, and so I was like, the, the story of this hoax is fascinating, and what would people I don't know, like waste time to, to, to take a photo of a, of a random flower and, invent, a flower and invent a story that it was flourishing in Himalaya every 400 years and that our generation was lucky to, to get it and please share it with as many people as possible because we're so lucky. And then it made me think, the more innocuous false news like this, but still a bit spectacular or a bit, um, as I said, sensationalistic, the more of such news you share with people, the more it becomes difficult for people to dissociate real information and, and real news to, uh, to false information. And that is when you can start sharing not so innocuous news and you've already created a pattern that affects people's ability of critical thinking. And you can see how when you when you have like the scope and the scale that we're dealing with today with the platforms that have opened up barriers, that have opened up um, the speed at which you can share information and the scale at which you can share information, we end up in this situation now when we can see how this information can threaten our democracy where people can no longer uh, think about even verifying claims about a political candidates when people uh, are not necessarily questioning a photo that is supposedly from the protest in Chile or the protest in Iraq. So, so we definitely need to address this. A lot can be done through education, but not just. We're seeing when some algorithms are pushing some kind of information, there they can be some solutions at that level as well. There have been lots of solutions when it came to fact-checking, 
um, these solutions have their, their constraints. We, we've seen how fact-checking is not always the best solution because even when presented with the fact-checked information, people, the doubt is still here and, and, and the damage is done. So for me, it, it, it's really, we, no one has the, the answer right now and we're still talking about it. I, Access Now is organizing a, an event later in, in 2020 when there is a whole track on disinformation and misinformation. And, and we are welcoming proposals and, and, and suggestions and solutions because I think that it is definitely a, a, crucial, a crucial issue, a crucial point, and we still haven't quite uh, found the solution. More things come when in terms to, yes, let's look at what the algorithm are, are, are pushing in people's timelines and how we can maybe limit that or, or understand. I think your Himalayan flower story also <laughs> underscores the reality that a lot of this is inadvertent as well, that this isn't always intentional, malicious use of, of these technologies, and that's an important point for us to remember. Jakob, did you have a reflection as well? Yeah, well, I think first of all, we should acknowledge that, that, that disinformation or false information is not a new phenomenon. It's something that governments have been fretting over for, for, for centuries, and very harsh laws have been adopted. Uh, in many places to, to counter uh, this uh, phenomenon that has been really prejudicial to, uh, to, f to freedom uh, of expression. I think the, n the new thing is the virality and scale of it, but I also think that, that there's been some really interesting studies of the uh, 2016 presidential election that actually showed that the, uh, the, the amount and reach of uh, false information was less than uh, reported initially uh, in the media. So it was a relatively small group uh, of people who spread it and relatively few were subjected to it on, on Twitter and Facebook. Whereas the, the, the narrative immediately after the story, uh, after the election was that it was sort of drenching and saturating. So, so I think that's, that's an important uh, uh, element to have, that, that we also sometimes need to keep a cool head. Uh, and not uh, go with moral panics when, when you have a certain narrative, fake news, fake news. Also because we saw, we, we've seen that a lot of governments have actually uh, used the, the, the concern about disinformation to, to crack down on journalists. So I think the Committee to Protect Journalists um, have this list of, 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 of journalists in prison and, and there was a rise in the number of, of journalists who were imprisoned for false information and typically this was not in, in democracies, these were in authoritarian regimes where, where governments say, well, uh, false information happens to be when it, whenever you, you write something that we don't agree with. Um, and I think the, 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 the EU uh, working group that, that looked at this came up with a number of very good recommendations, but also held very firm that censorship was not uh, one of the tools uh, that, that, should, uh, that should be used. But I think, you know, it, it also, you know, uh, th there's a cult whenever there's a new communication culture, uh, communication technology, it takes time to develop a culture. Uh, so if you, if, 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 if uh, just when I started using social media, I would probably be much more liable to believe whatever was put on there than I am today. So this is also says something about how we use uh, information. There was a very interesting study in my country. I think 12% of people have confidence or trust in information on social media, whereas they, whereas it's something like 60% who, who have trust in information in traditional media. I think that's a very healthy sign. Not, not because everything that is on social media is wrong, but you need to have a healthy skepticism uh, about it, whereas in general, um, traditional media, uh, at least some of them, <laughs> but like trusted media uh, institutions that have, that have shown over time that they, that they have good processes, live up to journalistic standards, you can, you can have a higher degree of trust in. So I think that's, that's one key takeaway. And maybe that speaks to the media awareness that the ambassador was advocating for as well in your country. Are there any other questions from the audience? Oh, please. Hello, uh, my name is Veronica. Uh, I am an intern in the Office of the Representative for the Freedom of Media, but I am asking the question, of course, in my personal capacity. Um, one of you, Melody, I think, mentioned that it is important that in all this discussion on the challenges mentioned that we ensure that civil society actors are involved 
which I of course agree with. However, in the OEC area, uh, we have different states. We are different, and we different state dif different participating states made different progress in the civil society development. There is also, uh, which I notice in, in especially among the, um, I don't want to even say authoritarian regimes, but even in the uh, certain political groups which appeal to some liberal sentiments, uh, the tendency to have uh, friendly NGOs, like uh, kind of the, technically the NGOs, but I mean, not really, <laughs> like, uh, uh, technically and supporting the government, definitely. So I wanted to ask you, how do you see we are coping with this challenge that even putting the civil society actors in the discussion may not always work for everyone? So what do we do then? And would be grateful for your suggestions. There is even a term for the NGOs that are not, not that independent from, from governments. We, we call them gongos. <laughs> um, and it's true, I mean, it's been a challenge. When, when it comes to diversity of views between member states, I can also guarantee that NGOs themselves have a lot of diversity of views. I mean, even in one NGO, I mean, you should attend our meetings or our calls when we discuss in new policy discussions. It turns into hours of debates. <laughs> Uh, that we had even on the case of facial recognition so, um, tech, for example, it, it's, it's not uh, always black and white on some issues to say let's just ban all of it or uh, let's allow all of it with some, with some regulation or some constraints. Um, I think being as open and transparent is always the first step. So when there is an initiative that is um, in, in, in drafting processes being open, that the, the initiative is, is underway, ensuring that you do consult, open consultations and not just open to a few. So me, I'm, I'm, I'm always very vigilant. When I'm being invited to some consultations, I ask who are the other uh, civil society organizations that have been invited? Can I, uh, are there representatives? Um, are there representative? I mean, uh, do they come from a diversity of, of countries that are going to be impacted by that regulation. If not, would you allow me to extend my invitation to others? Would you mind? Uh, would you like me to recommend some other uh, some other groups that you might want to to include in this process? And and sharing as well, if it's an open consultation, sharing with others the fact that it's an open consultation. And um, I mean, yeah, you may, as part of the open consultation, you may get. Um, positions that are, that are very close to, to, to some governments. And also some governments are, are putting forward some good proposals as well uh, sometimes. So I'm not, I'm not saying that there is a, um, a bad intention behind all member states' uh, new mechanisms or, or new initiatives. But yeah, definitely openness and transparency um, which is also true for companies, not just for governments. That's what we ask for, for companies as well. Open, the, the fact that we're asking for transparency reports is not just so that we can create beautiful charts and, and stats in, in, on socials and, and, and beautiful infographics. It's so that we can see what is being done and um, at which level we can also advise or, or or warn against um, new risks, new threats, or positive development as well. It has happened in the past that after a transparency report was being published and a few areas were, were being flagged, civil society offered some, some solutions that were implemented by companies and, and, and those solutions were being reflected in their following transparency reports. So it's also a, a way for us not just to be consulted and to provide recommendation and to express ourselves, but it's also a way to monitor, um, to monitor progress 
or, or regression sometimes. But. Maybe very briefly. Uh, of course, I, I would agree that uh, the liberal approach and openness is, uh, should be in the first line of, 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 of our answer. And, and we, are, we are still trying to find uh, the right way how, how to approach it. And, uh, and of course, that there are uh, NGOs uh, representing some extreme views, uh, extreme organizations as well as uh, there are those uh, ghosts, so-called fake NGOs. But the uh, but, uh, question always is who will judge who is who and, uh, and um, how, to, how to find criteria for that. So, so this is still an unanswered uh, question and, uh, and uh, because of it I absolutely agree that liberal approach and openness are so far the best answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jakob. Any reflections? Any other questions from the audience, please? Hi, I'm Maisie. I work with the uh, uh, Counter Trafficking in Human Beings Unit as an intern. And I just had a question about what the panel thinks would be an appropriate approach to the automated content removal, given that one of the primary reasons around this development was to prevent the upload of child exploitation materials, um, which personally I think is really important development given that every view, every upload is a form of re-exploitation. And I understand the necessity to also prevent this being used for political censorship, but where do you think the line should be drawn? So this is, a, this is a big question, and I do know that they'll be touching on this issue a little bit in the next session as well, but because we are three minutes away from ending the session and we are what stands between you and lunch, what I'm going to invite the panelists to do is make just a, some final reflections touching on the issue of content regulation and any other thoughts you might have as a closing set of remarks. So if we could uh, reverse the order and start with Jakob and move backwards, that would be great. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question, and I would, I, would, I would tend to typically differentiate uh, that between other categories such as disinformation or hate speech or defamation of religion that really touches on political speech and where it can be quite difficult to, uh, that, that can easily be, be I mean, it, I think it's more difficult to, uh, to exploit uh, content removal of uh, child pornography uh, than to use categories such as disinformation or hate speech that are very subjective um, and, and some of them like, like, like disinformation or defamation of religion even run contrary to, to human rights uh, standards uh, whereas I don't think anyone would agree that, that exploitation of uh, sexual exploitation of, 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 of children, for instance, uh, should be, should be uh, protected by, by freedom of, uh, of expression. Um, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, it's, it's not a topic that, I, that that type of speech is not something that I have focused that much on, I must admit, but, but, um, but I, I would think that most people see that as a special category that raises f significantly fewer free speech issues than those that touch upon um, where political speech is, uh, or, or opinion is, is involved. Melody, some final reflections from you? Yeah, no, likewise, actually, um, there's been lots of uh, studies that have shown that AI is uh, surprisingly very good at identifying child pornography, and therefore that's why automated content removal for such content is so successful. AI is not so good at removing other forms of, of, of content online, as, as Jakob said, and when we talk about, for example, um, even violence, violent images, it, it becomes much more difficult when uh, AI is not able to differentiate between uh, content pushed by a terrorist organization, for example, for propaganda uh, purposes, or a human rights group uh, trying to document uh, human rights violation during a, a conflict. AI is not able to do that, which is why automated content removal for such, um, such uploads is, is more difficult. So my final words would be strong appeal mechanisms, human review, 
which is something that exists now and a bunch of other organizations have also called for. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this afternoon's discussion to keep learning and um, looking at especially what, what kind of solutions are, are going to be put forward. Thank you very much. Ambassador, final reflections? Speaking, uh, I was speaking that we need to develop uh, new human rights standards because of the new technologies and, and I think that it is also valid about uh, the online content because we have regulations, we know what's the criminal content, we know what's the terrorist or extremist content, so, so I think that it's uh, basically all what's needed when uh, there is such a need to remove something what's, uh, what's online and of course uh, different countries may apply a bit different standard but it is also something uh, where this organization can help by talking about about the best practices and, and, and uh, exchanging uh, the experience in this kind of uh, in this area and in this field, and it's basically what's what's going on at different levels, including committees, which 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 uh, uh, I have the honor to chair. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers for this thought-provoking presentation. He has very good speaker and a superb uh, moderator. Thank you, Georgia. And as mentioned by Georgia, there is an excellent lunch waiting for you right now in that room in the four aisle. Please uh, make good use of it and enjoy the food, and we'll see you back at 2.30 precisely. Thank you.